At the violet hour, when the eyes and back turn upward from the desk, when the human engine waits like a taxi throbbing, waiting, I, Tiresias, though blind, throbbing between two lives, old man with wrinkled female breasts can see at the violet hour the evening hour that strives homeward and brings the sailor home from sea, the typist, home at tea time, clears her breakfast, lights her stove and lays out food in tins. Out of the window perilously spread, her drying combinations touched by the sun's last rays on the divan are piled, at night her bed, stockings, slippers, camisoles and stays. I, Tiresias, old man with wrinkled dugs, perceived the scene and foretold the rest. I too awaited the expected guest. He, the young man carbuncular, arrives. A small house agent's clerk with one bold stare, one of the low on whom assurance sits as a silk hat on a Bradford millionaire. The time is now propitious, as he guesses, the meal is ended, she is bored and tired, endeavors to engage her in caresses, which still are unreproved, if undesired. Flushed and decided, he assaults at once, exploring hands encounter no defense. Her vanity requires no response, and makes a welcome of indifference. And I, Tiresias, have foresuffered all, enacted on this same divan or bed, I, who have sat by Thebes below the wall and walked among the lowest of the dead, bestows one final patronizing kiss and gropes his way, finding the stairs unlit. She turns and looks a moment in the glass, hardly aware of her departed lover. Her brain allows one half-formed thought to pass. Well, now that's done, and I'm glad it's over. When lovely woman stoops to folly and paces about her room again alone, she smooths her hair with automatic hand and puts a record on the gramophone. The Wasteland Professing literature. We don't know where you are, but we're in Oklahoma City. We don't know when it is for you, but for us, it's the month of July in the year of grace 2021. Professing Literature is the podcast where we look closely at short passages of important works of literature in the hopes of seeing writers in action. We work across literary genres and modes, whether comedy or tragedy, drama, poetry, or fiction looking at the dynamics of a passage in order to understand what the author is doing and what is at stake for the work as a whole, the issues that it clarifies and the techniques that are involved. I am David Anderson. I'm Associate Professor of Renaissance Literature at the University of Oklahoma, and I'm joined by Mr. Eric Williams. How are you, Eric? I'm doing great, David. How about you? I'm well, thank you. Um, it's good to be back with you. This is a little bit different because it's the first time ever we've got the second half of a double episode, um, yeah. which I guess is uh, some sort of uh, milestone for us. And so I have been meaning to ask you, um, how are we doing? I, I don't think we've gone viral yet because I assume I would have heard about that on the news um, if that had happened. So Indeed. we probably, you know, we probably aren't quite yet ready to retire and just live on this, but um, in terms of the statistics you get as the person who actually understands how the interweb works, how, how are things looking? I think that we've done really well, like you said. It's, uh, it's just really fun to see the different places in the United States that we've gotten listeners from. Okay. Um, 
there's all different states. Probably, obviously, we're going to have some from Canada because you are. Oh man, yeah, the, I've, I've I've brought the Canadian fan right. base with me. And then we've got quite a few from the United Kingdom, lots from Australia, which I think is is that there are, there there kin. are relatives of mine in Australia yeah. also. Yeah, um, that's true. And so, if any of them are listening, uh, Morris family, um, much love from Oklahoma. And we've got some listeners, yeah, Russia, Netherlands, India. And these are, they're not insignificant. It's not like one time somebody downloaded it and there's multiple ones. So Okay, so even if they did it by accident, maybe that same person came back again and thought, yeah, um, yeah. I'll, I'll keep this going. Well, that's uh, that sounds promising to me. Um, that sounds like the beginnings, not just of uh, what will one day be a large and profoundly loyal national audience but an international audience yes. a, a global audience yeah. um and so yeah it's, uh, it's a little bit like those graphs that investment professionals show you where they're trying to encourage you to boost your retirement savings where it's like <laughs> yes if uh if you if every month from beginning at age 20 you invest um a hundred dollars of your paycheck uh at 12 percent then you know by age 30 you'll have x and by age 40 you'll have y and um by age 70 you'll have like a hundred million dollars yeah or something like that so so are you yeah. saying that maybe by the time we're 70 yeah this podcast that's right we'll, we'll have a hundred million kind of fans 100, okay um yeah, but we're we're starting small um and that's the right way to yeah. start it and we're, um, in, we're in for the long game yeah that's, yeah that's right we, yeah. we're we're you know there will be there will be ups and downs probably there will be there will be um, you know, there'll be a slow building process probably, and then it will hit and then we'll be kings of the world. And, you know, that yeah. might be the point where our heads get a little bit too, too big. Um, and we kind of take our eyes off the ball. Right. And a hungrier, leaner, meaner, scrappier literature podcast for a while yeah. starts stealing our thunder and yeah. we'll be treated like, um, like the dinosaurs. But then, because we keep pushing, then they start writing articles after that, you know, 10 years after that, about how everybody had written professing literature off. And yet, look, they're bigger than ever. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. that that's, you know, um, in other words, it won't be perfect all the time. Yeah. I but um, yeah. I can live with that kind of a trajectory Yeah. Um, that takes us um, into the billions of downloads. That's okay with me. And and. If you're listening right now, um, as I think I've said before, you will be able to say you were a professing literature fan before it was cool. <laughs> and isn't that really why we take up any cultural product yeah. um, for the for the chance that we might be able to say that? Yes. So we'll uh, we'll throw some kind of party at the 30 year anniversary or something yeah. like that, um, and all of you will be welcome. If you are uh, um, enjoying the podcast. We wouldn't be at all displeased if you uh, shared it with a friend or if you gave us a rating or even a review, passed it around a little bit. We've gotten some really encouraging emails from some wonderful people out there who've appreciated what we've done. So um, please do drop us a note. And uh, if you feel like it, ask a question in that note. I can't promise it would come up in a future episode, but we've talked before about how we like the idea of a kind of Q and a episode and it doesn't have to be the sort of question a graduate student in literature would ask, you know, a, a piece of life advice actually is, is the less you can behave like a graduate student in literature, the happier and more successful you're likely to be. So if instead it's just a normal human question, like, why do you think Lady Macbeth said that? Or, I didn't understand what you were saying about Mr. Knightley. Can you explain it in a way that is comprehensible instead of stupid? Um, <laughs> then that's a great question. And that's, you know, simple questions, questions of clarification can often take us to really interesting places. And so it doesn't have to be that kind of graduate student question that's filled with jargon and, um, you know, trying to show off. So normal, regular people questions are welcome. And Eric, can you once again give the listeners that email address? Yes, you can email us at professingliterature at protonmail.com. There you go.
All right. Well, please do get in touch if the Spirit should move you to. We are talking once again today about this wonderful, unexpected, although now so familiar poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, one of the most important poems in English in the 20th century, the poem that launched T.S. Eliot towards poetic eminence. And if you listen to last week's episode, you may not need me to do a recap, but it can't hurt. We got halfway through the poem roughly last time in our conversation and saw that this is the love song of a depleted, enervated era. A love song uh, that is a kind of anti-love song, not aggressively anti, but apath- an, an apathetically anti-love song. The title character who we presume is the speaker of the poem, J. Alfred Prufrock, is, as his name implies, an anxious, fussy, self-conscious man, a man of the polite classes, a youngish man still, but a man who feels like he he suggests that he can almost feel himself growing older. The poem is a broken confessional. Last time, I believe, we left off talking about the epigraph to the poem, um, where Eliot quotes six lines from Dante's Inferno. He quotes them in Italian. I'll reread them to you now in English. And these are spoken when Dante has a conversation in hell, in the eighth circle of hell, with a man named Guido da Montefeltro, who is being punished in hell for having been a false counselor on earth, and so he is imprisoned in a tongue of flame. He tells Dante the pilgrim, If I but thought that my response were made to one perhaps returning to the world, this tongue of flame would cease to flicker. But since, up from these depths, no one has yet returned alive, if what I hear is true, I answer without fear of being shamed. So Guido is conjured in, up in our minds as someone who wants to speak to Dante, who wants to tell him the truth of his life, but who only does so because he believes that Dante will never tell it to another. Guido is in hell, and Prufrock himself is in a kind of hell, and Prufrock, like Guido, is burdened with a desire to speak, to say something. And yet this something is apparently so terrible that by analogy to Dante or by allusion to Dante, it's suggested that he would only ever tell it to someone who was trapped down in hell with him. So this poem is a confessional. It begins with the invitation, as we saw last week, to conversation, to a wandering conversation. And yet it's a confession where clarity is constantly deferred where Prufrock never does say exactly, clearly, what it is that is weighing him down. And we can only sort of sift through this stream of consciousness, meandering utterance, wondering exactly what it is that's weighing on him. It seems clear already halfway through the poem that part of Prufrock's problem, at least, concerns women. He is interested in women. He is fascinated by women. He desires women, and he is afraid of women. He pays attention to them, and he imagines them with an unhealthy narcissistic self-consciousness. He imagines them being unimpressed by him when they attend to him, noticing his growing bald spot and the thinness of his arms and legs. In the, uh, group of sort of quasi stanzas with which we left off, we saw this mingling of fear and desire. And part of the fear you will recall at least had to do with Prufrock imagining himself being talking to a woman and seeing those eyes and being pierced by those eyes, not in the sense of a lover being pierced by a rapturous glance from a beloved, but rather it's the piercing of an entomologist, of someone who studies insects, who would take an insect and stick it and pin it to the wall. That's how he, that's what he believes the eyes would do to him. In other words, they would maybe see him, but see him at depth in a way that makes him helpless and ashamed. So that's where we left off with the poem. I'm going to reread the whole poem 
just because that seems like the right thing to do as well as the useful thing to do. And then we will pick up where we left off. So here I go. The love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. I won't read the epigraph again since I've just done it. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient, etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. Streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask, what is it? Let us go and make our visit. In the room the women come and go talking of Michelangelo. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. And indeed there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides along the street, rubbing its back upon the window panes. There will be time, there will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. There will be time to murder and create, and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Time for you and time for me and time yet for a hundred indecisions and for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of a toast and tea. In the room the women come and go talking of Michelangelo. And indeed there will be time to wonder, do I dare and do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. They will say how his hair is growing thin. My morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest but asserted by a simple pin, they will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions, which a minute will reverse. For I have known them all already, known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons, I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. I know the voice is dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a farther room, so how should I presume? And I've known the eyes already, known them all, the eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase, and when I am formulated sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the butt-ends of my days and ways, and how should I presume? And I have known the arms already, known them all, arms that are braceleted and white and bare, but in the lamplight downed with light brown hair. Is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl. And should I then presume? And how should I begin? Shall I say, I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows. I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. And the afternoon, the evening, sleeps so peacefully, smoothed by long fingers asleep, tired, or it malingers, stretched on the floor, here beside you and me. Should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis, but though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet, and here's no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker, and in short, I was afraid. And would it have been worth it after all? After the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me, would it have been worth while to have bitten off the matter with a smile, 
to have squeezed the universe into a ball to roll it towards some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all, if one settling a pillow by her head should say, that is not what I meant at all, that is not it at all. And would it have been worth it after all, would it have been worth while, after the sunsets and the dooryards and the sprinkled streets, after the novels, after the teacups, after the skirts that trail along the floor, and this, and so much more, it is impossible to say just what I mean. But as if a magic lantern threw the nerves in patterns on the screen, would it have been worth while, if one, settling a pillow, or throwing off a shawl and turning toward the window, should say, that is not it at all, that is not what I meant at all. No, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I'm an attendant lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two, advise the prince, no doubt an easy tool, deferential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious, and meticulous, full of high sentence but a bit obtuse, at times, indeed, almost ridiculous, almost at times, the fool. I grow old. I grow old, I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing, each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves blown back, when the wind blows the water white and black. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown till human voices wake us and we drown. So there you are again. There's the poem. We left off with proof rock offering those three wonderful quasi stanzas keyed around the phrase, I have known them all. I have known them all already. What has he known? He's known the evenings and mornings and afternoons. He's known the eyes. He's known the arms. He has known community of a sort. That's probably too strong a word. He's known women at a sort of polite distance. He knows what they look like. He knows enough to fear their eyes. He knows the small banalities of polite society, stirring one cup of coffee after another, having the same conversation over and over again because it never gets to a level of depth. He wants more, but there is too much that inhibits this most inhibited of young men. And so we pick it up at about the halfway point today. Maybe for me the most powerful part of the poem. He is asking himself when we broke off about whether he can begin to say what he wants to say. And he says, and how should I begin? And should I then presume? In other words, can I say this thing that would be a presumption? And how should I begin? So this is a poem where the truth of what Prufrock desires to reveal is always deferred. Deferred, deferred, deferred. And here he defers again. And he says, instead of offering us a clear statement of what he wants to say, much less a clear statement of what he wants, instead he paints with images, although he does so movingly and teasingly. He says, shall I say I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows. It's a wonderful image he's given us. We have to notice, though, that this is a response to his earlier question, his immediately prior question, and how should I begin? Well, should I say... Shall I say I've gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves, leaning out of windows? Why is this image called up by him when he asks himself or us how he should begin to speak? 
there's something about this image that I find intriguing and even haunting. Proofrock is asking us to imagine him seeing, at dusk, on the narrow residential streets perhaps of London, the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows. First of all, notice that it's not a lonely man in shirt sleeves. It's lonely men in shirt sleeves. So there are multiple men in this posture smoking these pipes. They are in their shirt sleeves. So in other words, these are the white collar class of the new urban, of the, of the post industrial urbanization. The generation of white collar workers who live more comfortably than their physically working fathers and grandfathers, but also live more distanced from the reality of things, the paper shuffling class. So they are in their shirt sleeves. In other words, at the, it's at the end of the day and the jacket is off. And of course, they're in a posture of relaxation, leaning out of the windows, smoking. And of course, smoke often conjures up the idea of prayer, but this is not incense, it's pipe smoke. And as much as I like pipe smoke, it's not maybe suggesting very much that is prayerful. These young men, I don't know if they're young men, these men are all doing the same thing, but they are doing it in a way that is atomized. In other words, this is a generation of men that are lonely in the crowd. Everyone is doing the same thing, or at least multiple people are doing the same thing. Multiple people are the same kind of thing. The white collar male, home and tired at the end of the day, smoking the pipe, sticking the head out the apartment window, and yet they're doing it isolated from one another and unaware of one another. I think it's fair to say. Prufrock is one of these men, we think, or, or he's close to these men. He certainly is isolated like them. But he is also perhaps different from these young men in that he is so acutely self-conscious. He is aware of himself, even as he is aware of them. And we see this preternatural self-consciousness throughout the poem. He is the one who is always standing back and looking at himself and looking at himself with disapproval. But part of what defines his self is his status as someone who is not a countryman, not a physical man, but a dapper, well-heeled, perhaps, scion of polite society who feels so disconnected from life and from the world, disconnected from the opposite sex and all of that entails with physical and emotional satisfaction, with beauty, and also with procreation and the idea of advancing the species being fruitful and multiplying. So he is not like those ancestral dancers that we talked about last week or last episode in Eliot's Burnt Norton, who dance around the fire at wedding time as their forefathers did for innumerable generations. Prufrock is a feat. He is disconnected, and he is aware that he is a feat and disconnected. And so he says in the following couple of lines, an, um, a very famous phrase of Eliot's, I should have been a pair of ragged claws, scuttling across the floors of silent seas. So we have here the image of a, cr of a crustacean, a lobster or a crab that scuttles in, the, in that wonderful, I guess, synecdotal phrase, a pair of ragged claws. Why should he have been this? That's a strange thing to say. But it's an image that conjures up a great deal that seems to fit the portrait we're already building in our minds of proof rock. He should have been a crab on the bottom of the ocean floor. The crab is lonely and isolated, scuttling. It seems to be singular, and it is also buffered. The crab is protected by that hard shell, that hard carapace. Um, it's protected by the ragged claws which seem to define it, and it is buffered under who knows 
how many hundreds of millions of gallons of water. Water so thick, so deep, as to make the world below silent. Prufrock should have been that creature, presumably because it better suits the sense of isolation and perhaps the longing for protection that defines him. That's what he should have been. He switches gears again at this point, and we forget about the crab. Maybe not. He says that the afternoon, the evening sleeps so peacefully. There's a sense of drowsiness that overtakes him and overtakes his life. The late afternoon drowsiness. Um, it's like as a parent, there are certain times of day for me that are just killer. And it usually is when I'm putting my own children to sleep that I just feel the wall of fatigue um, toppling over on me. That time of day when the afternoon seems to be sleeping. Um, I don't know if that's exactly what Prufrock's talking about, and he's certainly not a man with children. But he's describing this time of quiet late in the day, when everything seems to be at peace. And so why would you disturb the peace? Why would you shake things up by saying something? It's smoothed by long fingers, he says, asleep, tired, or it malingers. So there's, a, there's an admission there that this afternoon stillness that he doesn't want to break could be the stillness of peace, but it could also be a malingering stillness, a sickly stillness of apathy and loitering, emotional and spiritual loitering, rather than of rest. The afternoon, however, is lying there drowsily, almost like a character in the little scene he's about to paint, stretched on the floor here beside you and me. So he's addressed someone. He said, you and me. So who are we, the reader, supposed to be imagining ourselves? Well, now he seems to be, it's in my opinion, and I could be wrong, there could be a better way to read this. In my opinion, all of a sudden, Proofrock is imagining a more concrete situation, that he might say something. And I think what is implicit here is that he's imagining that he might say something on a given afternoon to a young woman that he's interested in. It's a quiet afternoon. It's a quiet afternoon. They've got cups of tea, half drunk beside them. There is not much going on. It might be just the kind of moment one is looking for when one wants to confess something, confess something to someone, and that something that he wants to confess is maybe, I'm passionately in love with you, or maybe simply, would you mind if I called at your house tomorrow so that we could go walking in the park? In other words, it doesn't have to be quite so passionate. And we're not clear exactly what Prufrock might want to say, but we know it's somewhere in that direction. Somewhere between, could I come calling on you because I'm romantically interested in you, or that might run all the way to, I'm passionate for you. But this is the moment for something like that in this afternoon that is either marked by rest or by malingering. This afternoon that is stretched on the floor here beside you and me. So is this the moment? Is this the moment to say this thing? And he continues and says in another immortal phrase that mingles the, the sort of phrase of, of bathos, of, of, of empty heroism and bombast that peters out and reveals itself to be ridiculous, should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? So this is a moment of potential crisis, albeit one that seems to come after tea time, which seems like an odd moment for the drama of a crisis, but this could be the moment to ask that big question, that emotionally loaded question. After We've had our tea, perhaps after the servants have been dismissed. But he can't do it. And he says he's wept and fasted, wept and prayed, although he is a kind of religious Aramite. 
he has wept and fasted, wept and prayed, and here he makes a significant allusion. But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet, and here's no great matter. So he concedes that what he has to say is small and maybe mean and trifling, and that he is not a prophet. He is not the one who could make this kind of intervention. He says, he makes a comparison of himself that's a very telling comparison. I have seen my head grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter. So a head on a platter. There's one story in particular that that is going to evoke, and it's of the death of John the Baptist in the Gospels. Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, the great prophet who comes before Jesus to prepare the way, who is judicially murdered by King Herod because Herod has locked John up because he's a troublemaker. He's a rabble rouser. Herod has locked him up, but Herod doesn't want to go to the trouble of killing this man who is both a good man and an immensely popular and respected man. But his wife, who is angry at John, dupes Herod into making a promise to kill John, and we're told his head is brought into their banquet on a platter. It's an enormously grisly idea of a beheaded man's head brought in upon a platter, you know, mingling the horror of the decapitation with this kind of polite banqueting culture of using platters and things like that. And so Prufrock says, I have been in this position. I have seen my head brought in upon a platter and notice that it's that slightly bald head. He can't let go of that. He is aware of how he looks and how other people, he, or at least how he believes other people look at him and the judgment that they level at him with his thinning hair. He has seen the head brought in upon a platter. What does that mean? He has been mortified. He has been embarrassed, but I'm no prophet. Unlike John the Baptist, I'm not a prophet. I don't have something of significance to say. I've been the guy whose head has been brought before the banqueters on a platter, but not because I had anything much to say, anything that could compel. John could move heaven and earth. Jesus says of his cousin, John the Baptist, that of all men born by woman, none was greater than John. Prufrock is telling us, ain't nobody going to say that about me. I am no prophet. I might be decapitated. I might be the insect wriggling on the wall, the one everybody can look at, the one everybody can judge, the one everyone can find wanting. But don't go thinking that I think I have anything much to say. And so he says, um, continuing on, I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker. So there have been chances, there have been opportunities. But he says, I've seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker. A footman, of course, is a servant in a great house or perhaps a gentleman's club or at a theater, a luxurious theater, who would sort of perform acts of, of, of liaison, getting people things, opening doors, and holding coats. And to be the sort of person that a footman would snicker at as he holds the coat, right? The footman is doing his job, the footman is not saying, go to hell, you loser. The footman is doing his job, earning his money, holding the coat for the gentleman to shrug onto his shoulders. But the footman thinks so little of this man whose coat he's holding, who he's paid to hold, that he snickers. And to be the sort of person at whom footmen snicker or who imagines that footmen are snickering at is a terrible fate. He says, he finishes the verse paragraph by saying, and in short, I was afraid. And in short, I was afraid. So there have been one or more moments where greatness was flickering, where a question could be asked, where I could act. And again, we're not exactly clear whether that act is a grand statement of passion or a fairly commonplace statement of, you know, the first stages of erotic interest. Would you be interested in going to a movie? Would you like to get coffee? 
and the healthy person can ask that question and survive the rejection. No, I'm seeing someone else. Or, I'm sorry, I don't think this is a good time for me right now. A healthy person, or even something nasty, a healthy person can survive that. It doesn't taste good, but it's not the end of the world. An, un an unhealthy person, or at least of a certain kind, will be devastated by that and will imagine that the universal footman, the eternal footman, is laughing at him and so cannot ask the question in the first place. Once again, Prufrock repeats pieces of phrasing that we've seen before. He does that in the following verse paragraph. He continues to ask the same kinds of questions with similar locutions. He says, he once again returns us to a dining room or a breakfast room. He says, and would it have been worth it after all? So would it have been worth it? Would it have been worth it? You know, this is someone who is already maybe in the early stages of middle age, already consumed with regret for all the things he didn't do. Or not that he didn't do, he didn't even try to do. Would it have been worth it after all? And he begins listing the items. Remember, he measures out his life with coffee spoons, he has told us. And now he begins, begins itemizing the various accoutrements of his life spent in drawing rooms and salons and dining rooms, the cups, the marmalade, the tea, the porcelain, among some talk of you and me. So imagine a moment, a man and a woman, maybe a young man and a young woman, maybe not so young, we don't quite know, but imagine a moment where two people seated side by side, having tea with a handful of other people in the room, are having a polite conversation, you know, do you enjoy your work at the solicitor's office, Mr. Prufrock? Miss so-and-so, did you grow up in the countryside, etc., etc.? Some talk of you and me, you know. Uh, do you like sports? Do you like music? That kind of thing. Polite conversation, but polite conversation of the kind that is personal enough that it might provide an opening for a larger question. And he says, would it have been worth it? He keeps repeating this phrase. Would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile? In other words, to kind of grin at yourself and say, here I go. Here, here I go. We'll see what happens now. I might be about to fall on my face, but I'm going to ask her a question. Would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile? So fair enough. Alfred, you have a moment here. You have a moment here. It might not work out the way you want, but it might work out the way you want. So risk the mild social faux pas and the slightly icky feeling of the woman saying she's not interested. Risk that because something much better might happen. Would it have been worth it to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to have summoned up my courage? But notice the grandiose way in which he inflates the situation. Because a moment like this, in a, you know, it's important to keep in mind for all the teenage boys out there who are interested in that girl with the great curly hair who's a flu, few lockers down from you at high school. It's important to both recognize this could be a serious thing and a meaningful thing for my life or for her life if we start dating, but it's also just dating. We're not getting a mortgage together tomorrow. But Prufrock says, would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile? And as I say, that's fair enough. But then he goes on to say, to have squeezed the universe into a ball to roll it towards some overwhelming question. Well, now that, I think, my friend, is going too far. That is unhealthy. Whatever aspect of social interaction you are hung up on here, that you're having a difficult time managing, yes, these things can go deep, but it is not the universe at stake. It is not the universe at stake, as if the whole universe were being wagered on the outcome of this thing. And yet for a man as emotionally constrained and paralyzed, etherized, to use a phrase from early, at the beginning of the poem, as he is, everything would seem to be riding on that. And so, of course, if asking this question is just a matter of being 
somewhat disappointed and then moving on, you can ask the question, but if the universe is at stake on the outcome of this question, maybe the wise man doesn't bet this hand and once again folds. So would it have been worth it? Would it have been worth it to roll the universe to some question? And then he says, we almost might think for a fraction of a second that he's about to be clearer about what he exactly wants to say. Remember this deferral I've been talking about through the whole poem. To roll it towards some overwhelming question. To say, okay, to say what? To say what? To say, I am Lazarus come from the dead. That's what he would say. So we have another New Testament allusion, another allusion to the Gospels. Ten lines or so after the John the Baptist allusion, we have Lazarus. Now, biblically literate listeners will know that there are two Lazaruses in the New Testament. There is the more famous Lazarus, who appears in the Gospel of John as the brother of Mary and Martha and the good friend of Jesus. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead in John, four days after his death. He comes to the tomb where the mourners are and where the rabbis are and Pharisees, and he has them roll away the stone. It is a foreshadowing, of course, of his own resurrection. And he calls Lazarus, and although Lazarus has been dead for four days, Lazarus comes out. And of course, it's a wonderful speculation. It's a speculation that Robert Browning, a poet that Eliot admired deeply, played with in a remarkable poem called The Epistle of Karshish, the Arab Physician. What did Lazarus see? What was it like to talk to Lazarus after he had been resurrected? So that's the one Lazarus this could be. Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all. I shall tell you all. But there's another Lazarus in the Gospels also. It's the name Jesus gives to a character in a parable, Lazarus and the rich man. In the parable, Lazarus is a poor man, a beggar who dies at the gates of the rich man, sometimes known as Dives, the rich man. Um, They both die on the same night. One is a beggar at the gates, the other is a wealthy man. Lazarus, Jesus says, as he's telling the parable, dies and goes to sort of heaven, to the bosom of Abraham, whereas the rich man goes to hell. The rich man, it's an amazing, it's a psychological masterpiece, this parable, apart from anything else. The rich man is begging his keepers not to be let out of hell, but he looks way off in the distance, looking up, I guess, so to speak, and he can see Lazarus in bliss. And he asks, the rich man never asks to get out of hell, but instead he asks that Lazarus be sent down into hell, that he would dip his finger in some water and cool and drop the, and, and then touch the finger to his, the rich man's tongue, to just give him that tiny bit of relief in his suffering. He's told this can't happen. No, rich man, Lazarus isn't going to hell for you not even on a quick visit. Then he asks that Lazarus be sent back to warn his brothers not to wind up where he has wound up. Again, you know, not very considerate of Lazarus, that he be sent back into the world. And he is told that they had the law and the prophets, his brothers, if they don't believe those, that even if Lazarus comes from the dead, they won't believe him. So there is no use busting poor Lazarus out of glory and sending him back onto earth on a mission to your brothers. Your brothers already know what is true. If they're not going to believe it, then even someone coming back from the dead won't convince them. And so I think clearly both of these um, allusions, both of these Lazaruses, Lazari, are at stake in this illusion. But it is so powerful. And remember Guido de Montefeltro also in hell. We have that in our minds too, the epigraph from the beginning of the poem. This idea, he says, that, you know, what he is about to say might be like someone coming back from the dead with truth to impart. 
But the reason why I think the Lazarus of the parable uh, of the rich man is the stronger candidate or the the stronger illusion, although they're both present, than the more famous Lazarus is because of this idea of someone coming back from the dead with a truth that no one will heed or listen to. You know, what if I took my chance and I said, I'm Lazarus, come back from the dead to tell you, but they won't believe it. They won't listen. They won't take it seriously. To say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead. Come back to tell you all. I shall tell you all. And he breaks off. We don't know what exactly it is that he would tell. But we are given a picture of her hypothetical response. If one settling a pillow by her head, on a sofa perhaps, should say, that is not what I meant at all. That is not it at all. So what's going on here? Well, he's suggesting, what if I worked up the nerve? What if I got my emotions channeled so that like Lazarus come back from the dead, I could say that thing, that undefined thing to her, if she should sort of settle herself in her seat and say, you missed my point. I was telling you about what a nice time we had last weekend playing croquet. I was just being polite. I wasn't trying to suggest you should invite me to tea with your friends on Saturday or whatever it is. I wasn't opening the door. That's not what I meant at all. That that was not it at all. The world would come crashing down, at least for this man. One more time, would it have been worth it in the next verse paragraph? Once again, Eliot is going back to this phrasing. Would it have been worth it? And now we're expanding beyond the tea table, and we're imagining the other, the other little touchstones of normal life. Sunsets, dooryards, sprinkled streets. So it's as though the camera lens is pulling back, and we're moving from the tight focus on the room to a sort of wider view of the neighborhood and to life in general, novels and teacups and skirts that trail along the floor, and this and so much more, would it have been worth it? What? Would what have been worth it? And then he catches himself here. He stops the scene painting. He catches himself and says simply, it is impossible to say just what I mean. And that might be the line that sums up the whole poem. It is impossible to say just what I mean. The poem that begins with an epigraph from hell about a confession that must never be repeated in the mortal world. A poem that begins properly with an invitation to conversation and that throughout is hung up on these little vignettes of conversation that doesn't go anywhere because the risk is too great. The risk of exposure, of honesty, is too great. And so now finally he says it is impossible to say just what I mean. Okay. Is that your problem, Alfred? You can't, because of these anxieties and fears and inhibitions which seem to be so characteristic of the 20th century and which it also seems to be are even more characteristic, getting stronger every day. Thank you, online world. In the 21st century, you know, we've gone from what Auden called the age of anxiety to, I don't know, or the age of hyper-anxiety or Auden didn't, Auden, you ain't seen nothing yet anxiety. But Prufrock bought in early on anxiety prior to the First World War, and he says it is impossible to say just what I mean. And so, why even bother, why even attempt to make that disclosure? Yet, even if it is impossible for him to say just what he means, he imag- let me put it this way, he imagines himself unable to tell the truth or to say what matters to him. And yet at the same time, and we see this in the immediately following lines, at the same time, he imagines himself exposed to other people. So the thing he wants to say cannot be said, and yet they see and know and criticize anyway. Just like those women who, you know, are whispering to one another 
as he goes down the fa- the stairs isn't his hair getting thin, just like that woman who would fix you wriggling on the wall with her gaze. He says, it is impossible to say just what I mean, but as if a magic lantern through the nerves in patterns on a screen. I assume, I don't, uh, I am no expert in the history of science. I don't quite know when um, the Curies made their breakthrough with radium and with the X-ray, but I assume this is an early reference to X-ray technology, to the idea that my innermost self, the inside secrets of my body, could be shown by a magic lantern on a screen. That's scary. I can't say what I mean. And yet another, or perhaps if I did, another could come and see me, could look at me, could have all those secrets to rifle through and have the full awareness of all of the anxieties that I find so dismaying. That's what would happen to me if I tried to talk to her. And again, he goes back to this idea of the woman in comfortable surroundings, settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl and turning toward the window should say, that is not it at all. That is not what I meant at all. So once again, we have a varied echo of something he'd already painted. It would not be worth it. It would cost too much to be exposed if she did not respond as I'd hope she'd respond. Better to say stay, stay safe. Better to stay at home. Better not to get in the car and drive at all than face the possibility of an accident. And so he begins the next first paragraph, another, you know, with more very, very well-known quotation, another very, very well-known quotation in it. He begins it by saying, no, no. He is closing the door to that possibility. He is not going to face the possibility of what the kids call rejection. I guess everybody calls it rejection. But that, that one was not coined by the kids. Uh, but he's not going to face that possibility. He says no. And then we have another illusion. This, this one is not to the Gospels. This is to Hamlet. Hamlet is an interesting figure to bring up here. In some ways, Hamlet is like Prufrock. He is inhibited in some ways. He is incredibly introspective, maybe to the point of paralysis. But Prufrock is not going to flatter himself by comparison to Hamlet. Hamlet is, you know, what does Ophelia say? Oh, what a noble mind is here or thrown. And she describes all the way in which Hamlet is great as a warrior, as a politician, statesman, as a scholar. Hamlet is full of greatness as an intellect. Prufrock says, you know, for all his inhibitions and second guessing, no, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. That's not my role. Hamlet dies at the end of the play, getting revenge as he dies. And he is a tragic figure, but he is a great figure. Tragic figures aren't just sad, they have dignity. And Prufrock is a man without that kind of tragic dignity. And so he assigns himself a different part in the tragedy, and it is not that of tragic hero. I'm not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. Shakespeare did not write that part with me in mind. Instead, he says that he is an attendant lord. And he goes on to describe the role. And he's clearly describing Polonius, another character in Hamlet. Polonius is an unimpressive, entertaining, but annoying character. Polonius is an older man. He's a fusspot. He is a would-be manipulator and conspirator, but he is too self-regarding and not bright enough to pull off that role that he's assigned himself. And he's a kind of pathetic figure because as he attempts to as he attempts all kinds of machinations on behalf of the wicked King Claudius, Polonius, in a sordid, squalid way, gets himself killed in the third act and doesn't even make it to the end of the tragedy. 
And so he is a politician. He's a careful man. And he is also a windbag. Prufrock says, full of high sentence. So in other words, language that aspires to being grand, uh, but a bit obtuse because Polonius doesn't understand usually what Hamlet is up to or even what Hamlet's point is. At times almost ridiculous, almost in t- at times the fool. Polonius is not a fool character if we're speaking categorically when it comes to Shakespeare. A fool character would be the grave digger in Hamlet, but he's not that far off maybe. He's pretty ridiculous, and Hamlet, the tragic hero, the man, shows how ridiculous he is. That is the role Prufrock has cast himself in. He will be Polonius. Polonius is not a romantic hero. He's not much of anything. And Prufrock now, in this state of resignation, having pondered for a while the possibility of doing, of saying, now is in a state of sort of fatalistic resignation. And he says, and he says it twice over, and remember, when it comes to poetry, repetition equals emphasis, I grow old, I grow old. Said it twice, just in case you missed the first one. I grow old, I grow old. You know, he has missed his chance. He's seen the moment of his greatness flicker, and now all he has to look forward to is decline. So what if you do, or if you're old? Well, I don't know if you're old in 1910, but he says, I shall wear the bottom of my trousers rolled. I don't know if that is, um, I, you know, I think this might be from the era where, tra- where men's trousers and suit pants were beginning to be cuffed with an iron. You know, you'll still to this day on men's suits, that's a style that goes in and out. Sometimes you'll see a, a, a cuffed trouser, sometimes you won't. But maybe I'll do that. And I don't know. I don't know enough about the sartorial habits of East Coast America and England in 1910 to really be definitive here. But maybe he's saying, I'll wear the kind of ridiculous rolled trousers that the old men wear, because that's all I'll be good for. Or maybe he's saying, I'll move into this new, you know, I can I can pick up that little touch of contemporary fashion and that might offset the oldness a tiny little bit i'm not sure any of our readers who are historians of uh, 20th century men's fashions are welcome to get in touch and so the poem is almost over now he's got more questions but they're questions about how he will manage his life now that he has embraced the fact that he's old the first one is shall i part my hair behind got to cover up this bald spot somehow doesn't seem to occur to proof rock that you just let that bald spot shine forth in all its glory and anyone who doesn't like it can go to hell or look in another direction how am i going to manage that they are going to be looking at it shall i part my hair behind you know he's contemplating some kind of comb over another famous question do i dare to eat a peach and this is an intriguing one Why is he worried about that? Why is eating a peach something that requires courage or daring? Well, I don't know. Good ripe peach. I look pretty ridiculous eating a peach. I don't know about Eric, but I think that's maybe one of those foods that are best eaten either in private or in the, you know, when surrounded by family and friends. Um, A juicy peach that's worth eating is something you make a mess on. It's a little bit like uh, my rule for corn on the cob is that that's something you can only eat with family or close friends because no one wants to see that who isn't close with you. So maybe that's it. A student of mine a little while ago pointed out that this might be suggesting, you know, the fact that a fruit like a peach or an apple for someone who is older and whose teeth are starting to go is no joke, that every piece of fruit you bite into is a little bit of an adventure. Will I be the sort of person who has to think about whether it's worth biting that peach or not because I might lose a tooth in it? You know, um, that's a sad way to think about aging. And that's what he's trapped in. I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. That's what I will do. That's what I will do when I have reached this place. So these are 
tokens of the fact that he is either giving up or is try- or he is trying to think about how to reconcile himself to this new identity of old man because the opportunity to have actually acted to have done something to have said something even at cost he's let that go and he's not going to try to ride that horse anymore and so will i do this or that or this other thing And then he surprises us once again and says, I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. Obviously, he's being figurative here. So what are the mermaids? Well, the mermaids are creatures of the ocean. Disney tells us they are human from the waist up and they are fish from the waist down. And Disney, maybe not only Disney, but definitely Disney, has given us an idea of mermaids as basically being nice, beautiful, talented people of the sea, but who are just like you and me, only their extremities um, have a rather different physiology, some different anatomy. But of course, in the classical tradition, mermaids were not supposed to be your friends. Mermaids were monsters. The fusion of the human and the fish is not supposed to be nifty. It's supposed to be monstrous. The mermaids are threatening because the mermaids use their beauty to entice so that they may destroy. The mermaids come alongside ships at sea. They swim up beside them. And what do they do? They sing. They sing to the sailors on the ship. You know, imagine someone who's been at sea for three months already on the way to India around the Cape of Good Hope, and they still haven't touched at the Cape yet. They've got half their trip still ahead of them, but because of the wind, they've just been at sea for months. And so this sailor, who's probably got one thing on his mind at this point, hears this singing, this beautiful singing, looks over the side of the ship, sees these beautiful females in the water, one or more, I guess, below him, dives in, and only at that point makes the discovery that the bottom half does not match up with the top half, at least when it comes to, at least when, uh, as a matter of what he thinks should be. And so the sailor is then drowned and eaten by the mermaids. So the mermaids present a kind of fearful picture of female sexuality as something that is both desirable, exciting, and also threatening. And yet Prufrock, Prufrock, remember at the beginning of the poem, he said it twice in the room, the women come and go talking of Michelangelo, you know, and we, we said last week that it's not exactly clear just what that is referring to. And that's okay. Elliot doesn't want it to be. Michelangelo is the great sculptor of male beauty in the male form, the masculine, if you think of David and Moses and the slave statues and the Sistine ceiling. Michelangelo is fascinated by the heroic male form. And that's what these women are talking about. And yet this is a man, this speaker, who is thinking about how they are always thinking that his arms and legs are growing thin. You know, that he's on working down to his last drop of testosterone. They know it when they look at me. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think that they will sing for me. Being devoured by the mermaids, some kind of metaphor for sex, I guess. But even that is not an option for him. It's not like he's saying romantic fulfillment, passionate love, that is sustaining and maybe even sustainable. This is what I want, but it's beyond me. Now, even the mermaids devouring him is beyond him. They don't sing for me. I'm not one that they're trying to get over the side of the boat. They look at me and they're happy to swim on to the next guy. The end of the poem, the final Seven lines or so is the most enigmatic part of the whole thing for me, and I won't say a great deal about it. He continues to talk about the mermaids. He said that he's heard them. Now he says that he's see, he has seen them riding seaward on the waves. 
he describes them almost surfing or something in a sense, combing the hair of the waves is how he sort of colorfully puts it. And then he says, we have lingered in the chambers of the sea. So imagine us, you know, that those ragged claws again scuttling across the floors of silent seas. We've been down there in the sea, among the sea girls, by sea girls wreathed with seaweed, red and brown. So we've been down there with them till human voices wake us and we drown. And I don't quite, I'll admit to you, know what to do with the ending there. I'm not exactly sure. When he talks about the sea girls wreathed with seaweed in the caverns, maybe he is suggesting that we have lived among fantasies and then human voices wake us and we drown. You know, we come to the reality of the opposite of fantasy, death, something like that. I'm not sure. So I don't exactly know what to do with the end of the poem, but that's okay because this is a poem that doesn't want you to fix and formulate it. Prufrock himself is afraid of being, of speaking too clearly. And so he only suggests and cr tries to triangulate and tries to keep us away from full knowledge. So it's not the worst thing that the poem ends that way. I will say now as we're beginning to close that this is a poem that is partly about the breakdown of relationships, fundamental relationships. The relationship, I think, probably between man and God is there in the background, but that's one that Eliot will explore in a lot more detail in his later poetry. We have the breakdown of relationship between man and woman, and it seems to be part of a wider breakdown of community because Prufrock doesn't at any time really describe friendship. He describes interaction within a setting of refined politeness. But there seems to be very little holding him into the world of human beings other than a fear about how people look at him. And that maybe makes him such a perfect 20th century protagonist. It's about the breakdown of sex itself as this thing that used to be loaded with meaning. And he wants it to hold that meaning. He's a little bit in this way like Holden Caulfield. Holden wants sex to matter more than it matters. He doesn't understand the way the oldsters look at it, but he's also alienated from the ways that his peers like Stradlater and Carl Luce look at it. In the Wasteland, the great poem of the 20s, maybe the single most defining work of literature of the modernist era, at least in England, you know, maybe worldwide, not counting Proust or maybe Joyce. In the Wasteland, in part three of the Wasteland, the fire sermon, Eliot surprises us. He's been surprising us throughout that poem. The Wasteland makes proof rock look like a straightforward, clear, five-paragraph essay. The Wasteland amplifies the uncertainty and free association and stream of consciousness effect of proof rock through the roof. And so Eliot has been bopping all over the place in the Wasteland, and then he settles in for the extended passage that I read to you. He paints a scene. The scene is spoken, we are told, by Tiresias, a character from Greek mythology. And without getting into the details, because they would take too long, Tiresias is a prophet, but he's a kind of a pitiful prophet figure. He shows up all throughout Greek mythology, Greek tragedy, the Odyssey, so epic poetry. He's in hell. He's another character from hell in the Odyssey, or at least from Hades, I should say, the underworld. He is the blind prophet of ancient Thebes. So he cannot see, although he can see. Because remember when we talked about Milton, there is a relationship sometimes between physical blindness and inner light. And Tiresias is one of those who can see without seeing. He's also a slippery, difficult, kind of unappealing figure in many ways. He's an old man who had for seven years been sentenced by the gods to be a woman. He lived as a woman for seven years because of an infraction that he had committed against the gods. 
And so he was cursed with that. And so Elliot makes him a kind of androgynous figure, very old, sort of masculine, sort of feminine. And he is the kind of narrator in this passage. And the passage I read describes sex in the wasteland, the wasteland being Elliot's shorthand for the modern industrial or post-industrial world that has been evacuated of meaning where there is nothing but what he calls the heap of broken images. And Tiresias gives this passage the sort of tone of a prophet who has something very weighty to describe, you know, some war among the gods or something like that. But instead, what he actually does describe is this incredibly depressingly banal picture of sex. It is the violet hour, he says. He repeats that phrase twice, the violet hour, which is a beautiful way of describing dusk or sunset. But it's the violet hour when, again, we're in the white-collar world, the eyes and back turn upward from the desk. So this is the world of white-collar dreaminess, or dreariness, excuse me, and that's fitting because the character he's going to talk about is the typist. The typist, this young woman who is part of the newly professionalized cadre of white-collar female employees in the early 20th century, the typist. She is home for tea. He actually uses an allusion to Dante there, the, hour, the evening hour when the sailors long to be home from sea. But everything in this passage that borrows from the grand or the high or the lofty is deflated because... What happens at the violet hour? Well, it's not a great love story and it's not a great tragedy. Instead, it's just something squalid and low and depressing. The typist home comes home for tea. So the early evening meal of the British middle classes. What's the first thing she does in her little flat? Well, she clears her breakfast. So depressingly, her breakfast dishes and maybe the food itself are still sitting out where she left them. So first she puts those away, and now she's going to have her tea, so she lights her stove and lays out food in tins. This is the cuisine of the modern working man and woman, unfortunately, the pre-packaged food that we are only sort of in my lifetime trying to pull ourselves away from as we, we attempt to make this return to real food. But she lays out food in tins. So the experience of eating for her is a kind of false one, an unhealthy one in a way. Yes, there's perfectly good canned food. I'm not trying to offer a prophetic denunciation of all canned food, but here it's suggesting the artificial, the unwholesome, and that's her evening meal. And there are other things that are going to follow that are artificial and unwholesome. So she lays out her food in tins. Tiresias describes what he calls her drying combinations that are on the windowsill. This is her underwear her etc etc stockings slippers camisoles and stays he says so they have been left out to dry on the divan the couch which is also her bed on the one hand this could be a very cruel portrait of this young woman's life i don't think it is i think elliot is sort of showing us a picture of the world we've created and it's a world without meaning and it's a world of loneliness, and that loneliness is intensified rather than diminished when we are with another person, even another person within a context of intimacy. Because that brings us to the expected guest, as Tiresias sort of sacerdotally describes him, the expected guest. Well, who is the expected guest? Is it a hero or a demigod? Is it a singer or a poet? No, it is the young man carbuncular, which is a wonderful over-the-top way of describing a pimply-faced young man, the young man carbuncular. He arrives. Who is he? Well, we are told he's a real estate agent, a small house agent's clerk. So not even the agent, but just the clerk who works for him. And yet this young man carries himself as though he's the captain of the football team. Elliot 
in a devastating phrasing, says that he is one of the low on whom assurance sits as a silk hat on a Bradford millionaire. So this kid walks in like he owns the place. And now we launch into this pitiful, slimy seduction scene where a man and woman who don't love each other and aren't even especially attracted to one another and aren't even especially sexually excited nevertheless go through a kind of series of gropes that eventually leads to an unsatisfying consummation. Notice how Eliot describes this, that he endeavors to engage her in caresses, which still are unreproved if undesired. So she doesn't want this. Um, It's not that she hates this or actively dislikes it. It's just that she doesn't really care that much for him, but we're given no sense that she's afraid of him or anything like that, that there's any coercion here, but just that she is as indifferent as she is to him. She is even more indifferent to the idea of doing anything about this. And so she just puts up with it. And we're told that his vanity requires no response and makes a welcome of indifference. So he's not proud enough to care about the fact that she's not interested in him and is just happy enough that she's not bothered about the whole thing to put up with him. And then we have him leaning, leaving on the unlit stair, this image of going down into darkness as he leaves her flat and of her shrugging and saying, well, now that's done and I'm glad it's over. It's not that she's saying that in the voice of, you know, profound relief at being saved, but just, you know, that was some sort of tedious thing I had to go through, but I got it over with. And she puts her record on the gramophone. That's sex in the wasteland. Proof Rock, it seems to me, is on the cusp of something like that. He wants more than that and good on him. He is not a young man or a kind of young man who is especially jaded and cynical, I think. He doesn't have anything terribly corrosive in his attitude towards women. He maybe venerates them too much in a kind of unhealthy way or of sex. He wants something that I think could be summed up with a word like love or connection, but he is afraid of it. He's in a situation of intimacy that's maybe of a, of a kind that his ancestors weren't allowed to enjoy. The sexes were kept just that little bit more um, separated, if not by walls, than by conventions. But he is unable to close any kind of gap emotionally with them. And so there's the kind of, in Proof Rock, there's the looming sort of cliff of the wasteland, utter deterioration of, of uh, sexual mores or propriety or meaningfulness. And Proof Rock is instead just a young man who doesn't know how to connect to what he wants. And so it is not just that this um, person is a kind of loser who feels alienated, but that his, his alienation is more meaningful than that. It's more, I think, culturally central and important than just, it, it, this is not just a one-off. But he doesn't know how to close this distance. And therefore, he kind of represents in Eliot's hand, he's a kind of emblem of a culture that is forgetting how to close the distance the way those ancestors did as they danced around the fire which is not to say that those were all perfect relationships or those were all perfect couples or those were all people who lived in a world where inequities and unfairness did not make my life more difficult than it needed to be. But we now have become alienated in so many ways from one another and from the world and from ourselves. And maybe it's something like the first step is proof rock, And the second step is the poor typist and the young man carbuncular. Anyway, Eric, that's a lot of minutes spent talking about one poem, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. We got through it. 
I don't know if I can say the same for our listeners. We've had a proof rock marathon over the last two episodes. It just feels to me like a poem that has so much in it and um, that it's worth trying to bring it out. I hope you enjoyed that. Until the next time, this is David Anderson for Eric Williams. Farewell. Thank you.